Fabulous stuff. So Bill is going to talk to us about contrast echocardiography, a powerful tool in diagnosis and management. Uh, certainly contrast has been uh, in, in our arena for quite some time. Uh, so Bill, we're looking forward to giving you our uh, new insight into contrast echocardiography. Well, before we get started, how many of you are in echo labs? Okay, and how many of you are using contrast? I would say maybe a third. Okay, well, I think then this talk is appropriate. So we can maybe highlight a few areas about contrast that would be, that would be important. Now, when we talk about contrast, it's very interesting because you can generate these tiny micro bubbles by either agitating any solution and injecting it. So you're not really creating gas, but you have micro cavitations that would reflect ultrasound. And we use this agitated saline or whatever solution to you know, see if there is any shunting. So all these micro bubbles that are quite large do not pass the pulmonary circulation. And when you see a shunt on your left side there, uh, then there is either a shunt through the cardiac chamber or through the pulmonary circulation. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to talk about is the myocardial contrast agents that are even smaller. They are in the tiny micro micrometer size. And these tiny ones have a shell composition and they have a little gas, inert gas. And we have actually three companies, so three types of microbubbles in the United States that can be used for your diagnostic accuracy on the left side of the heart. And the indication nowadays for the left side of the heart, if I cannot see this heart well, if I can't see more than two segments, it is very appropriate for us to use contrast agents to enhance our detection of the endocardial motion and therefore evaluation not only of regional but also of global function. So I had to borrow this slide from Dr. Randy Martin. No, Randy. <laughs> because we, we don't have any difficult studies in echocardiography. Here. Uh, okay, Randy. Uh, is the heart, anybody, is the heart normal function or is it abnormal? How many would say normal? How many would say abnormal? There's only one volunteer in this whole audience. <laughs> Randy, what do you guess? So I'm, I'm looking guess, at- Just guess. Just so I would say, I'm trying to think of what you're gonna surprise <laughs> us with. I'm, so I would say that it's abnormal. Okay, there you go. Quite normal. It shows you, ladies and gentlemen, that anybody can be a fool. <laughs> um, if you can't see, you can't diagnose a thing, right? I mean, this is the message here. So for, for, for you, uh, if you're not involved in this, or if you want to review on, this is the position paper from the American Society of Echocardiography a few years ago, and it really has not changed. The indications are still the same. But I know we use it a little bit off-label, if you will, uh, for the same reasons. And the reasons are, yes, you want to delineate at times hypertrophy. You certainly still, among the first indication, is you can rescue uninterpretable studies. Stress echocardiography is really not approved for stress echocardiography, but we use it. And I know some companies are you know, having studies now to make sure that this would be hopefully an indication down the line. And they can talk about it. A Doppler signal on the left side from aortic stenosis with a caution that at times if the contrast is quite high, you may overestimate the velocity and therefore you will overestimate the gradient. So be careful on this. And uh, at times you certainly for thrombus definition or pseudoaneurysm formation. And we know that it is one of the appropriate use criteria. Um, so the inappropriate one is routine use of contrast if even all the segments are visualized, the certain appropriate one if I can't see enough more than two segments or more. I'm gonna share with you two studies. Um, you know, part of it, maybe historical things, just to tell you about the power. So these are ICU patients on fundamental imaging, you barely can see the heart. 
you add a little harmonic, you could see a little better. You can add harmonic and contrast because it enhances the contrast. And this was done here in this institution, you could see. And these were indicated for transesophageal echocardiography to assess what the heart was. And look at what the data showed that in green, if you use contrast and harmonic, it's pretty much almost the same as to overall evaluation of ventricular function compared to transesophageal echocardiography. So this is one. The second study is the impact of what you do every day. In our institution, the sonographers are empowered to decide when to use contrast so they don't have to get an okay from a physician, et cetera. And it is actually embedded in the order. It said, contrast if needed. And therefore, that decision is made. By the sonographer at the bedside, it's much better workflow. And as you'll find out, it's much better diagnostically and even cost effectiveness wise. So we had a cohort, consecutive cohort of more than 600 patients in these situations where they were technically difficult. So before contrast, mostly in red, technically difficult studies. Some of them completely uninterpretable in yellow. After contrast use, the vast majority were interpretable. Still some of them technically difficult, we understand that. And these were in different situations. One, <clears throat> inpatient wards, so they're inpatients, medical intensive care unit, surgical intensive care unit, outpatient, and total. And notice that still in the surgical intensive care unit, you may have still about 20% that are technically difficult because of so much, in, so much instrumentation on these patients. They're really sick. Now let's take a look at what's the impact from a decision point of view on the clinician. The major impact is in intensive care units. Take a look at that. Is avoidance of a transesophageal to evaluate ventricular function almost 30%, and avoidance of nuclear imaging about 23%, and certainly the least in the, is in the outpatient setting, but the others are in between. Importantly, is it changes the decision regarding thrombus formation. At times, you'll be suspecting a lot of thrombus because of reverberations, and many of them actually did not have a thrombus, while the other is, is also true. At times, you may not suspect it, and you'll find out a thrombus in a bad ventricle. So the impact on medication change is also significant. Either a hemodynamic drug, an inotrope or the other, is added, or some of them are removed because ventricular function is very good, and tachycoagulation started, or stopped. So overall in this cohort, if you take a look at the surgical intensive care unit in the middle, the impact is almost 50%, like 46% of either a change in something, either avoidance of a procedure or changes in medication. The others are in between, and the outpatients about 13%. I can tell you, share with you, that our utilization of contrast in the inpatient setting is about 15% of the total volume higher, obviously, highest in the surgical intensive care unit in the outpatient setting between 6 and 7%. And for, for stress echocardiography is about 70% overall. And that comes with a saving of about $120 per patient. So better diagnostic accuracy, better saving, and at the same time, having a diagnostic modality that instead of the physician saying, I cannot interpret, technically difficult with all the excuses that you have, actually, you will be able to interpret that study. Remember that if you use contrast, you're not gonna be able to interpret valvular regurgitation because it will enhance all, all the color flow Doppler. So this is not the time to interpret your regurgitant lesions. Also, it will hide if there is something on the valves. So you're not gonna be able to see valvular structure if you're looking at a vegetation or other things. So this is predominantly for either ventricular volume or at times enhancement of a continuous wave Doppler jet, which is rare. The most important is ventricular function assessment. And this last slide from a data point of view, and we'll go, we're gonna show you some cases, is it makes sense. It says in this same cohort, if I have more and more number of segments that I can't see, my diagnostic impact and my management impact is much higher. So if I almost can't see anything in this heart, my impact is almost 100%. If I see you know, half of it, you know, my guess is, is about right, maybe 50% of the time. So therefore, you know, use it as you need. Okay, let's give you here, uh, let, let's get um, your input. What do you say about this ventricle? 
And notice that I give you not only one view, I'm going to give you multiple views. Do we agree that this ventricle is bad? I don't think there's any question, right? Although, few things. I can't see all the segments, so I'm going to say depressed ventricular function overall. You know, hypokinetic segments that I'm seeing and the others I'm not seeing. Period. Thank you very much. Next case, right? So if you use contrast on this particular patient, okay, yes, you see other segments, but also you're seeing a thrombus that changes your management. And you are not suspecting it because even though I used, you know, I had some segments that I couldn't see, I couldn't see the apex well, so use it appropriately, particularly if there is a suspicion going on. All right, let's take a look at this case. What's the ventricular function like? Normal? Normal, right? We agree. Regional wall motion. Normal? Where are your weedies? <laughs> Is it normal or not? Regional function? Not normal. Lateral. Somebody says lateral wall. Okay, there is a suspicion. I read this patient, and I called it normal. All right, I'm giving you the best here, you know, the best views. And I get a call. I always show this case, so if you've seen it before, say thank you. Um, uh, but I got a call from Neil Kleiman, the head of the cath lab here, and he said, how could this be normal? I mean, this individual has huge Q waves in the lateral leads, and there is a history of myocardial infarction. He said, well, uh, maybe bring him back to the lab. And, and let's do a contrast, and maybe I've missed something, okay? Let's see how much I missed. Well, I missed a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it's very interesting because the only area that you could not see was about two o'clock and three o'clock on short axis. And this individual had, you know, an amazing, what looked like either an aneurysm or a pseudoaneurysm, and it was turned out to be an aneurysm in this area, okay? Uh, how about this patient? This patient came, actually during a live course, came in the night before with chest discomfort, 65 year old. And for those of you who can read an EKG, it's just not normal. Deep, <laughs> deep, right? And uh, just very abnormal T wave, certainly a very appropriate admission overnight. So this is the echocardiogram. What do you guys think? Abnormal, right? Where's the abnormality? Apical, right? Apical, so at least something is hanging there. So the diagnosis is an apical infarct, right? Do you agree with that? Yes? Okay, let's see if you change the diagnosis. Or apical hypertrophy, right? You got it. A yes, it is. yes, it is an apical abnormality, but the disease is different, right? So I guess the more you see, the more you can diagnose better, and this will actually change your management one way or another. What do you think about this case? Any, anybody uh, shout it out. Normal? Abnormal. What's the abnormality? Apical hypertrophy, somebody said. Uh, most likely. Uh, I'll give you a hint from an interpretation point of view. If you take a look at the epicardium, take a look at the epi outside. Hmm? There's no motion of the epicardium. Normally, yes, the endocardium comes in, but the epi also follows about 10%. And if the epi doesn't follow and the heart is not translating, the differential is two things. One, akinesis, because it doesn't move. Two, there's no place for it to go, right? So let's see how much no place there is to go. There's no place for it to go, okay? And actually you could see the tributaries, you could see you know, the arterioles you know, feeding in with contrast in there very nicely, okay? Let me show you this case. <clears throat> uh, this is very normal, right? <laughs> I, I don't need any imagination, right? It's an apical huge aneurysm, and I show you also the color Doppler, right? So it looks like pretty straightforward. 
uh, there may be an area of suspicion here in the apex, and that's the reason why <clears throat> contrast was used. No thrombus. The final diagnosis, a apical aneurysm, no thrombus formation, ejection fraction is rather worthless, as you know, in these situations, right? Take a look at the base, and if somebody's heart failure, conceivably, you could do some reconstructive surgery, et cetera, right? <clears throat> However, notice what you've missed. Mm. So the message here is don't look at the final product, right? See what happens in between. And color didn't show it. You know why? Because you are not in that same plane. Remember, 2D, unless you use 3D technology and with color and everything else, 2D is tomographic. And if you're not in that tomogram, you're, you're going to miss it. Contrast is 3D in a way. Right? So irrespective of where that shunt has occurred, if I didn't see where it's coming from and I saw it hitting the left ventricle before the left atrium, then I'm going to go and look for where that abnormality is. So in conclusion, a few things. One, it improves border detection, particularly in suboptimal studies, and certainly improves this for evaluation of regional and global function, particularly in the ICU setting. Better diagnostic accuracy, and also, it is cost effective, so use it appropriately in your laboratory and make it also easiest for the sonographer to be able to do that so that you could have diagnostic studies whenever you use it. It's very important to relay this information to the sonographer back and forth, so more and more appropriate utilization, particularly in technically difficult studies. Thank you very much for your attention. Great stuff. <laughs> very, very, uh, very, very good, Bill. Thanks.